from Geta to Usher, you're going to meet a hit maker. We got tons of questions in the corner office. Lots of good stuff. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Hey, everybody. How you doing? How you doing? Man, we got a great show for you today. We're going to have a lot of fun. I got a little sleep last night, so I could be dangerous. Possibly even entertaining and funny today. You just never know. Herbert, how are you doing today? I'm good. Um, yeah, all things good. Been a great week. Lots of good stuff going on. Lots of good stuff we're going to be letting people know very shortly. Right? Yeah, I can tell it's laundry day. Yeah, because all the other polls are away, so I, I had to go big horse. Where's Rudy? Where's Rudy when you need more wardrobe? I know. I, know. I, I got to get my Rudy shirt oh, out of the dry. Man, I'm, I'm I'm working on a really cool song for Rudy and Kyrie. And by the way, Rudy is uh, one of our clients. So big shout out to Rudy and and a bunch of folks. And and thanks to all the inquiries. Uh, we don't say this that much, but you know certainly you guys hit. Our website, which is pensadosplace.tv, and and uh, thanks for the inquiries with Dave and, and stuff that's going on. So big shout outs to you guys. Uh, lots of information going to be coming to that website very soon. We're making some changes and stuff to update you. We, we've got a, some very aggressive plans that are about to go into place. Excited about that. As usual, let's say hello to our Vintage King friends. Vintage King. Yay. There's our guy. He's in the chat room, Jacob Schneider. Oh, I got one for Jacob. So as we now have to play Stump the VK Dude, Dave, what's the question? Jacob, when I'm buying a piece of vintage gear, should I take into account the fact that I might not be able to find tubes for it? Are there tubes readily available for all vintage gear? Are there caps available? Transformers I know are not available. Uh, should that be an issue when buying vintage gear? So there's your stump the VK dude question, and Jacob Schneider's in there to do that. Um, also, a quick shout out to our friends from Avid. Uh, actually. One of our favorite guys is here watching the show. He's really working Avid, but he's we're one of your clients, so he's here. Shout out to GI. But anyways, yeah. um, lots of good stuff that we're going to be talking about with them very soon. Um, as usual, let's do our quick homework. Use your social media weapons and get to Facebook to talk to us. Get to Twitter to talk to us. Watch us on uh, YouTube as usual. And and last last but not least. Go to our website for information when you need it, pensadosplace.tv. I'm um, excited to have you, and let's not waste time. And Dave, let's tee up our guest. Hmm? Oh. I, well, you find that funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're entertaining yourself. <laughs> our advertisers are thrilled. Well, our guest told me to do it. Because mm. mm. normally you get high off these, but I didn't realize you could get yeah. high off these. The highlighters is where it's at. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this sounds like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we got, um, we got Mark Goodchild, Exit, Sace, for our Latin friends. Uh, in, in the house today. Mark, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. That was me. a horrible joke. I'm, I apologize. I don't think they know the sixth story yet, so... I do? Yeah, well, they, they, I don't oh, know they if don't. anybody else does. Tell, yeah. tell, tell us how Exit came about as your nickname. Well, I was a hip-hop DJ first, and I was DJ Mischief, which is a horrible name. <laughs> and uh, But at, around that time, I had a crush on a girl who lived on the opposite side of New Hampshire, and it was Exit 6, and... I would doodle it all over my papers, and I ended up just putting DJ Exit 6 together, chopped off the 6, and one I met DJ Enough, a big New York DJ, sure. one time at a party. I told him my name was DJ, DJ Exit, and he said it was cool, so it and went from there. You've been stuck with it ever since. Yeah. I and like it. it. Absolutely. And, and you know, you're nobody without a nickname in this business. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I chose Dave. <laughs> I uh, still call you Hard Drive. Oh, though. thanks. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I love that name. Yep, Richard Wolf and Brett Mazur gave me that name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, we got, um, you want to jump right in? Oh, cool. I've got so many questions for you. I've been a, a, you know, a, a, a big fan and admirer of your mixes for a long, long time. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, that, that I, I love about your story is that my story doesn't help anybody. You know? mm -hmm just don't do anything and get lucky. That's my story. So it's hard to kind of give that as a pearls of wisdom to <laughs> right. guys starting out. But your story is very exemplary of how to do things right. Give us a, a brief outline because, I mean, you know, New Hampshire is the hotbed of hip hop. So uh, <laughs> yeah. what, what forced you out of that environment and how did well, you do it? What was your thought process to 
to well, share with our audience? Well, coming out of high school, I, I really wanted to be a hip hop DJ, and New Hampshire wasn't the place for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to be doing a lot of mixtape sales in New Hampshire. So uh, I had been reading the Source magazine and I knew uh, the Atlanta issue. I think Redman was on the cover. I knew it was a hot place, and I was a fan of Jermaine Dupri and Dallas Austin and what was starting to really blow up mm -hmm. there. What year was that? That was 95. Oh, cool. Yeah, when I left New Hampshire. And um, I went there really to be a DJ, but I went to the Art Institute to get a, some kind of education in you know, music and technology mm -hmm. and uh, ended up getting an internship and realized that's really what I wanted to do. And once I uh, kind of decided to focus on it, I, you know, I grabbed it and went with it. But um, it, it kind of happened by mistake at first. But once I knew, I, went, I put all energy I ever had into it. And from the day I took my internship to even today, you, you know, the effort I give. <laughs> do you credit that decision of moving to Atlanta as being the, 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 the seminal point of, of when things started to happen in oh, the yeah. right in yeah, the you have to go where things are happening. But that took two years, probably, right? A year or two. Do you mean the from from New Hampshire to where you were actually? Oh yeah. Engineering, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It took a little time uh, because for a while I was still straddling the line of being a DJ or mm -hmm. deciding if I wanted to be in the studio full time. And I guess maybe around '99 is when I hung up the turntables and, mm -hmm. and stuck with the studio. And that gap between leaving AI, the Art Institute, mm -hmm. and getting into the real world, how, how did you solve that gap, that problem? Well, I actually had a job at DARP while I was still in school. Oh, so My internship didn't last very long. So your advice would be don't wait, just well, don't yeah. wait till you graduate, get a start a meeting. Yeah, I, <laughs> this isn't typical for most people, but I, only, I was only interned for three months. I, I like, really gave everything I had to it. I took every shift I could get. I stayed as was, long uh, as I could Monica get. Monica? Yeah, Monica Manchester. was the manager. This is when she just showed up. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they realized they were going to have to pay me pretty quickly. Oh, that's cool. So I, I, I was able to get on staff. And at that point, we were still working on two-inch tapes. So we had a job that was just the tape vault. Just logging in tapes, mm -hmm. so at least you know I was on staff at least doing that and maybe copying tapes in the morning, but uh, I did have a job before I was finished school, so I was a little fortunate in that regard. Yeah, that's great, Darp. Yeah. I don't think you could have found a better place for those yeah. of you that aren't familiar with Darp. Darp's in Atlanta, and it's Dallas Austin Studio. Dallas could be one one of the five greatest producers ever. He's a little eccentric, but Dallas can. He can do a rock record, he can do an alternative record, he can do a fish record, he can do a TLC yeah. record. And, and Dallas, Dallas definitely marches to his own drum, which I respect so much. Highland Place Mobsters is still one of my favorite records ever made. Yeah. Did you work on that? No, but... Was that Alvin? That was Alvin. Yeah, yeah. Alvin And Darren Prindle, oh. Oh, I believe he may have worked on that yeah, as well. Alvin's my yeah. boy. Yeah. And, and so you knew Leslie Brathwaite there, yeah. the whole Le gang? Leslie and Alvin were really my earliest mentors. I learned, uh, I learned very opposite things from them, but very good things from both of them. Yeah. Um, skipping the subject a little forward, Herb, he does this thing where um, when he's not too busy, like right now he's in the middle of a major record we'll talk a little bit about, so he doesn't have time to do it every month, but when he has time, he offers a, a free mix a month. Mm. And um, you, 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 he, he, take submissions and then, well, let you tell it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called Tweet Mix, based around my Twitter account. Mm -hmm. um, and what I do is, when I'm, when I'm not busy, I'll, uh, I'll listen to different submissions of different songs. And, and I do try to go out of my urban genre a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, whatever's the best or most challenging or, or whatever can make a, a, a difference in my um, presentation, I go for it. And basically what I do is, I take this mix, I mix it the way I think it needs to be mixed, and then I break it down on uh, my website, every single thing I did, at least the most, the most important, interesting parts. What is your website? Uh, Exit1200.com. Exit1200. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and I put a before and after. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the rough mix as it was, and this is what I ended up doing. It. This, is, uh, this is why I did it, how, and I, you know, I show all the major points of it. Mm. Yeah, it's all, it's all text and uh, just pictures now, so it's not video or audio, except for to listen. So it's not as you know, interesting as, as being able to watch Pensado's place. But, yeah, but I think that's yeah. a wonderful thing. I mean, uh, you know, it's like, I don't think engineers, or, or I don't think creative people in general, understand the importance to keeping you centered of 
doing things like that or, or like, like, like I, I don't like the term giving back because I didn't take anything, but, mm -hmm. but I, like, I like the concept, like, like I love the Boys and Girls Clubs, you know, uh, I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. What you're doing, then you also work with uh, Big Brother. Yep. Uh, I bet that's got to be rewarding too. Yeah, I, uh, there was a point in my career when I realized that I was a little, there's a lot of glamour and glitz around what we do, and I think sometimes that can kind of cloud your perception of what life is for just the average person, because that's what most of us are in the music business. There's some real crazy celebrities who live lives that we don't lead, and then there's us, who we are normal people. And for a while, it, it, I got a little clouded in what those two things were separately, so I decided to give back, although I didn't take anything, but I decided to give back into my own community of um, just volunteering, and uh, I went to Big Brothers because I had a big brother growing up, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and I was able to do it for about six years consistently. I had to stop last year because I was just too busy, mm -hmm. but uh, it was one of the greatest things I've done. Yeah, so. man, uh, guys, I want you to um, uh, go to Spotify when you can and, and uh, check out Akon's uh, song "Beautiful," and um, of course. Exit mix that, and you tracked that too, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah. you did everything on I that. I pretty much that specific album. I pretty much did the whole thing for recording and mixing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want you guys to listen to that because I want to discuss some of the elements of that now. Um, so, in the process of of, of tracking that record, um, did you use the John Hardy and the CL1B? Oh and, yeah. And what mic did you use? For Akon, it's been. Mostly the U87, and sometimes the Sony. But um, the Sony C800 with that, with the John Hardy and the two tech, it's a little bright. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I, I tried that with Usher on this album, couldn't do it because he's too, his voice is too open and and bright to have that combination. Mm -hmm. But it's usually the U87. And so once you get once you get it all down, take me through the process. Uh, we we discussed last week how how KD actually approaches the mix, but can you kind of give me more of a creative approach to the to the mix mm -hmm. uh, you started with the vocal mm -hmm. and then the thing that 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 impresses me about that mix is it it's there like when i do clarity i i have to cheat a little bit and get make things a little brighter but you got clarity but with a real organic kind of mm -hmm. just i don't know like the pad it's rare that I ever even notice a pad, much less get excited about a pad. Yeah. What did you do to that pad to make it sound so good? <laughs> well, my mixes contain a ton of automation. I don't compress much of anything, and I don't do any two-bus stuff at all. So Let's stop right there. Yeah. Expand on that, because you just, you, oh, my heart is racing. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, well, this is my philosophy. My, my mix has to be right before it, it gets to the stereo bus. Uh -huh. if, if I have to do something there, then something's wrong back in the mixture of the things I've already done. So you don't use anything on the stereo bus? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Um, in that particular song with the pad, I believe that may have been a plug-in PSP Vintage Warmer. But um, that song was really about balance because he just wanted to kick all the way here and trying to find a way to wrap everything around. I, had, I think I went to the PSP for that because it has a way of, of creating presence, but you can still kind of move things around it a little bit, but it, it will take thing, something from here in your stereo field and put it a little closer to your ears. Wow. And then um, the, uh, the, uh, the kick and snare are spectacular on that song. <laughs> I mean, how did you, how did you, philosophically, how did you get them to be that loud and not just have it be like a, a marching band? Well, I think there was a point when I thought it was perfect, and then he probably came in and turned it up more. <laughs> and I probably realized my, this mix just went from what I thought was great to musically distorted, and it was probably better. And I think also the mastering helped on that, but who mastered it, it? Eddie Schreier, who is, who is one of my go-to guys. Yeah, yeah. Eddie. Eddie is awesome. Um, I think when I'm mixing, I tend to, I tend to get to what I think I call a safe point and where I think everything is awesome. And then that's when my clients make me better when they come in and they push things in different Great. directions. Yeah. And then it goes to, that's where it's supposed to be. And that's what happened with that song. I'm, he came in, he turned that kick all the way up. Once, he, once, yeah. you, once you got it sounding good, mm -hmm. 
and then he turned the kick up, what adjustments did you have to make to the rest of the mix to accommodate that? Because it's, it's not just as simple as turning yeah, it up. Yeah, you're right. I probably had to VCA everything and kind of bring it down a little bit. Was there any sonic things you had to change? At that point, I let it live. No. <laughs> I, I, you, you can't change it. At that point, your rules don't matter. The, te the technical specs don't matter. Right. If it's working right then, that's what it is. If, mm -hmm. if it's peaking, Eddie's going to have to deal with it and mastering. That, that's the mix. You can't change it. It's, that's where the magic is right there. So. And, and Akon liked it. What, if he oh, yeah. likes it, then you can't, you yeah. can't unlike it. You know? What's funny about that song is the multi-track files, like the kick snare, pads, everything, they're all MP3s. No joke. Yeah, they're all MP3s and obviously, you know, imported and turned into waves and everything. But when I got the multi-track from the producer, who's a really good guy. Drew, make a note that we need to change all our files <laughs> to MP3s before we mix. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, oh, yeah, it's like throwing a Phoenix Crane song on everything before you even start. Um, <laughs> you like Dark Essence, right? You use that on vocals? Everything, yeah. I, I, use, I use it all over the place, yeah. For those of you that don't have the Phoenix uh, uh, set of plugins from Crane Song and Dave Hill. You can, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's inaccurate to say it's a tape saturation emulator. It does so much more, but it, I wonder, I'm trying to help the, the, the guys that don't have Pro Tools figure a way to get that sound, because it's such a great sound when you add that roundness to a bot, to yeah. bottom to a vocal with that. I call it harmonic saturation. You know, it just kind of pushes, it kind of pushes everything and, and brings life into something. I don't use, I don't ever use the word warm, so I'd never say that, but just something, it, 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 it cooks, it cooks things. That's what it does. It cooks them. Yeah. Yeah. And Any, I love it. Anything Dave Hill makes is incredible. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, I apologize. I'm too ignorant to know if he makes, uh, does Dave Hill make stuff for Logic, the Logic guys? Come on, GI. Don't, don't be a homer. Don't be an avid homer. I know they have the new AAX version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that too. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our audience struggles with finding a way to let the kick drum and the bass exist in, a, in, in the same space, and they struggle with that. And a lot of people say, you carve this out, you carve that. We don't carve. I, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. want people... Mm -hmm. But but you've got them existing in such a beautiful space. Uh, did you do anything memorable, or, or was it just a, a series with a lot of little small tweaks? Well, it's a series of small tweaks, and it's no carving at all. I don't I don't believe in side chaining or making room in the bass frequency for the kick to happen, or or vice versa. I, I agree I, with you. I don't do. That. I do like side chaining, but I agree with you. Well, in that instance, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. To me, I think. They can work together. You have to find a way. And I, I think I probably learned a lot from Leslie Brathwaite on that because the way he does is amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do you? Leslie gets so much, and yeah. he doesn't use a lot of outboard gear. Nothing. It just, it just sounds incredible. Yeah, he's he's great at balance and and low end balance especially. And mm -hmm. I learned from him. Don't don't muddy it up. Don't add things. Don't make it difficult on yourself. There's a way to turn push those two faders up mm -hmm. and make them work. Find it. Cool. So. You and I were talking earlier, and, and, and we were talking about how it's 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 a lot it's it's not that hard to teach someone how to get a good sound, like a good snare sound or something, or a vocal sound. But it's damn near impossible to teach them what a good snare or vocal sound is. How did you come from a complete neophyte to having the taste to be able to get these sounds? Because you you, you went to school. You, over time, you got the skills, mm -hmm. but without the taste, it's it's like a I'll give me a metaphor here, Herb, a, a chef that is a good gardener but doesn't know how to cook or something. Perfect. That's exactly what I would have said. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you, you still nailed. care, Herb? You <laughs> no, listen, I recognize perfection. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're blushing. I can't tell, but Just I think you're blushing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, what I'm trying to get at, Exit, is I don't think people understand the importance of influences, and once they get those influences, it can hurt them as much as help them. How do you transition from getting these influences of records you love without having them take over who you are and not come uh, out the other end being yourself? Well, or, 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 or like say Leslie and, and Alvin were so influential, how did you exit that with the, the taste but without being 
well, carbon copies of them. I'm going to say something that may be a little blasphemous, but I don't go to forums and look at how people do things, mm -hmm. and I don't, even though I do the tweet mix, I don't really try to research how Manny Marroquin does something or, mm -hmm. or, or Phil Tan, although I, I try to ask Phil what he does all the time. Mm, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, Phil's amazing, but mm -hmm. I, d I don't want to know their specific techniques. What I do is I'll listen to a record and I'll go in the studio and I'll make my technique. I'll there's, like, there's a way Bruce Sweetine got that kick in the snare to jump out and smack you in the face. Let me try this, let me try that. And I spend hours, all the time, even when I'm not working uh, on a paid session, researching in, in my own brain, coming up with my own techniques. And I think that's how you, that's how you do it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can use what you find in a forum or on an online tutorial as a starting point, but in, in, until you turn all that stuff off and turn on your own gear or your own plugins and, and start experimenting and finding mm -hmm. out, you know, maybe I'll use this vocal compressor on this kick drum and, yeah. and see what happens. That's that's when you develop those things. Yeah. That's what happens for me. It, 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 yeah. it seems like you'd have to do that to start to create your own signature. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, that's the only Other, way you do it. Yeah, otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm a mini you, or I'm a mm. mini something mm -hmm. else, which is which is fine. But you know, you don't want you to think? Be don't you think, for lack of a better term, the greats uh, would die before they would sound like somebody else? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, um, in any area. In any area, Absolutely. not just yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, for me. It, it was always um, I'd been engineering about three weeks, and and someone very dear and near to me said that he always took 300 cycles out of, a, out of his kick drums. And so for, I've said this on the show for, for, about, for about a year, I ruined more kick drums because I just took 300 out of it because you were supposed to. Mm -hmm. not, 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 it didn't matter what it sounded like, you were supposed to. Mm -hmm. And I think at the nucleus of what you just said about not wanting to know what other people do, did, that's, that's, that's the reason why, because mm -hmm. you can, you can create a monster out of yourself just as easily as it can help you, but you're too stupid to know which is which at that point in time. The, the time for me when I actually spent time trying to learn what other people did was after I'd already got my skill set and I'd be so happy that I did something like one of my heroes and then if, if I did it completely different, I was like, well good, I'm better than they are because I do, you know, it's like, and I'm not saying that in an arrogant way, it, it's kind of like like an athlete, if you don't really think that you can make those two free throws with no time left, you yeah. probably shouldn't be at the free throw line. Great, greatness oftentimes is about courage. And just the courage yeah. to say, I'm gonna find my own way, find yeah. my own path, take the shot, put it on my back, mm -hmm. whatever happens, happens. And sooner or later, you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hijack this for a minute. I know you're the guest, but, and I hate talking about myself. Well, I really don't, I like talking about myself. But, but I started a little late as an engineer, so I, didn't have the time to catch up um, to, to the people I perceived as being really good. So I made the decision, instead of trying to be good, I'd try to be new and different. And, and no one can criticize you because they can't measure you against anything. If you try to be good, there's a whole history of benchmarks that you can be measured against. But if you're over here just being unique, either they like it or they don't, but they can't tell you're not good because there's nothing to measure you against yeah. except yeah. yourself and I was always a pretty good version of myself and I think that element uh, knowing what I know about your career that 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 element exists in a lot of the things you've done too it's, mm -hmm. it's, rather than be like somebody else a half-rate version of somebody else you've always strived to be a hundred percent great version of exit you know yeah. are, there, are there you know inflection points along the exit career path where certain records you took that courageous step and you you could see where the meter moved for you or the response to the records you did or it's hard to say that there are uh, now nah, I can't identify certain points yeah. I think it's I think it's an everyday thing for me it's just a constant evolution yeah I, I yeah. really do I mean I'm a fan of everybody in this industry I love and I'm constantly I, I, I take the, the the stance that everybody is better than me just because I want to learn from everybody. You know, I mean, I still know I'm really good at what I do, and I know when I walk into a room what I can do, and I'm going to mm -hmm. kill something. But I still look at, um, you know, like the, the guys we mentioned, even Fab Fabian, uh, Serbin, everybody. I look at them like, I'll never be like that. And I think I use that to motivate me every day, mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. and then to go in the studio and learn those methods. But 
Yeah, it's an everyday. It's an everyday thing for me Constant because process. because also what we're doing and the way we do it changes so, so much, much too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I do. We were talking earlier. At the end of the year, I take every mix I've done. I have a chart, all these papers about this big, with all these different stats, and I look at every mix I did that year, and I critique it on did the client like it? How many revisions? Uh, do I like it? You know. Um, how is this frequency? How is this frequency? How is this frequency? And I do it on all the How songs. How does that take you? It takes a couple of days. And when my, my manager saw me doing it, um, she, she almost, she couldn't believe it. Like, why would you? I bother? still can't believe it. I want to yeah. see a picture of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay. But um, you know, the th thing is, is we, we, we had mentioned it's hard to sometimes listen to your own mixes when you're done, oh, and it, well. it could be for a variety of reasons because you worked on it for days, or maybe you don't like it, or but you just don't. And for me, I would like to conquer that, to know that everything I've ever done, I want to go home and listen to it and love it, mm -hmm. you know? Even if I worked on it for five days and I hate it, I, wanna, I, I don't want to have that feeling of, I don't ever want to hear this again. I would like to be able to do that. So that's why I started doing my own mix critiquing a few years ago. It was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to make myself look, exact, look at exactly what I do, how I do it, and, find, and force myself to fix what I think is wrong mm -hmm. and, and, and love what's right. Yeah, the reason I don't like listening to my older stuff is because every day I think I'm better and I've learned something new. And if I, when I listen to some of the older stuff, I just I, I literally go back and redo it just for myself, and I, I just don't have the time to do that. In terms of in terms of influences, um, like uh, we were talking about Lionel Richie and, yeah. and people like that, uh, and, and our influences don't have to necessarily come from other engineers; they come from hearing a great record or a feeling that you got the first time you yeah. heard I'm a thug or something, you right. know what I'm saying? It's like... That warm feeling, that warm yeah. thug feeling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, do, how, how, do you, how do you incorporate that, not in your mix, but as into, your, into this thing we're calling taste? How, how, do, you, how do you improve your taste? Hmm. If people pay us for our taste more than they do our engineering, we've got to figure out how to get better taste, don't we? Yeah. I... And as when I first started engineering, I was like a super hip hop head, and that's kind of what was, was my limited scope of influence in music, which was which is a shame. Since since then, I've kind of and the people I've worked with, I've grown to love so many things, and I even like bad music. But I think <laughs> I've learned to I've learned to love so many different genres of music for so many different reasons. So many different what? Different reasons, you no, know, no, for many different. Oh, genres. Genre. 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 Genres. 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 Yeah. Genres. Types. Okay. <laughs> um, basically moving, you know, um, whether it's Frank Sinatra wondering how do they make records sound like that, you know, mm -hmm. and do I even bother trying to incorporate anything like that into what I do? No. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to use all of these different, um, you have to use them as inspiration, basically. Inspiration. That's, that's yeah. a good way to think about it. Yeah. Like when I... I have a very specific way I listen to music. Like I only listen to soul music on Saturdays, and I only listen to some, <laughs> and I only, yeah, and I only listen to Sinatra and Sinatra-like stuff on Sundays. And uh, why do you do that? Because well, a lot of reasons for I guess for sanity. For one. Um, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. Yeah, but uh, I, I guess the reason I do it is because music. Uh, um, it elicits an emotional reaction from you. It's supposed to, mm -hmm. especially good music. Mm -hmm. So those are the emotions I want to feel that day. I was just, I was, I was just sitting here thinking, like, sometimes we're a victim of the music we grew up listening to, and sometimes it's an asset. Like being a DJ has to be an incredible source of information and, and exposure mm -hmm. to things to, to 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 help you in your engineering. Like I, I maintain that. All the the years and years I spent playing uh, in bands in front of every hostile audience in the South, I, I still try and get something to come out of those speakers that I think would entertain that crowd that's throwing stuff at me. Right. Uh, and being a DJ, you have to you, you learn how to manipulate a room full yeah. of people and, and and give them an experience. And so I guess being a DJ really helped in terms of I don't guess I know, but 
Well, I think being a DJ for me realized you need to shorten your songs <laughs> because yeah. I was a hip hop DJ and people like to keep it moving. Sure. You know what I mean? Right. Like everybody will flip through records every 30 mm -hmm. seconds. So when I'm in a song, I mean, I'm in the studio working on a song and it's going over four minutes. I'm like, you guys are dead. You know, <laughs> then you're never going to get past the first chorus. Mm -hmm. Like, let's, let's chop this, let's chop this, let's chop this. Although I'd probably not say that out loud. But. <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, maybe you could think of it as is don't do a, a 30 second intro maybe just do yeah. a 10 second intro yeah. and get to the hook get to the money as fast as you can yeah. guys I'm gonna update you a little bit and 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 when he says he's uh, when exit says he's he listens to a lot of music not only that he's he's worked with groups recently like David Guetta he did the Usher song what was the name of that song without you without you I yeah. love the vocals on that yeah. we'll talk about that in a minute yeah. LMFAO Gwen Stefani uh, Pitbull T-Pain of course, he, he's been Akon's main guy for a long time, tracking and mixing. Um, you did a stint with Manny Fresh over it. Oh, uh, yeah. He's one of my best friends, yeah. Uh, uh, what a talent. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson, Puffy, uh, Santana, Outkast, TLC, Stevie Nicks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for a hip-hop guy, you ain't doing too bad. I mean, these are, <laughs> this is a pretty big variety of, uh, of, of, of some of the greatest talents we have. Yeah. I, Erica Badu, I forgot Erica. Well, you know, I don't say no to any phone calls. <laughs> That's part of it. And I, a lot of that was a result of, um, especially uh, things like Stevie Nicks were, were a result of working at Dallas's studio. Because, like you said, he was all over the place. You know, you would walk in one day and George Clinton would be there playing pool, or Morris Day would be there, and then the next day, you know, it would be Madonna or something like mm -hmm. that, or Fishbone. It was or Christine Aguilera. Exactly. Yeah. It was it was really crazy the amount of uh, the variety of things happening there, so it, it was boy it was it was a that's a big asset for me yeah, to rely on. I have on. such admiration yeah. for Dallas. Yeah, I love Dallas. Um, there was a couple of other things I want to talk to you about. Um, you made a statement that that the cost of creating music now is so much less than it used to be that that music shouldn't be 99 cents a download it should be 49 cents a download um i don't know if i agree with that do i herb <laughs> i don't know <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me call you and see what you think later. <laughs> we'll talk about it I, I don't have the mental capacity to compute that one because i can see both sides of the story i mean we're in a different world i mean for sure mm -hmm. And I understand the concept. I mean, it's kind of like the Kmart principle. If you half the price, you sell twice as much, so it ends up about the same. But we are in a different world, aren't we? Yeah. Well, the reason I said that is because I, I feel like the value of music digitally, download, paid downloads, it, it's skewed compared to the price of buying a CD. We, uh, it's, you don't get credits that much anymore, mm -hmm. like on iTunes probably half of, mm -hmm. at least half of the top 100 albums don't even have credits on them. No. So already you're, you're being robbed a little bit of your shopping experience. Yeah, Just no, that that's, no, it, note to Neris. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that's a, I, it burns me, but anyway. Me too. Um, also, from a technical standpoint, we're selling less of a quality file compared to a CD, you know? Mm -hmm. So even though there is probably not a 50 cent difference between a wave and an MP3, if the average listener listens, they'll probably choose the MP3 anyway, we, really, we're, we are still giving a little less. So those are the more of the fundamental reasons I think music should be a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. The other reason is because it can, it can be gotten for free or for next to nothing. You can listen on Spotify, you know, the, the artists will still get paid there, but it's, it's much less, so let's bring down the price of the actual purchase because they're going to hear it in different regards anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it's a little inflated. I, we could sell a lot more and be at the same point, and then we can also look at mm -hmm. certification so you and I can have plaques on our walls again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that I, I just We're asking a lot to sell music at that price, I think. I hadn't thought about that, but I'm, I'm going to think about that because I think you're on to something. It's just, I mean, there's the physical cost of manufacturing something, like a, like even the plastic that holds the CD or the, yeah. the artwork and paperwork or the labor involved, that doesn't yeah. exist anymore. So yeah. and what is the cost? Well, you're, exactly. I mean, it goes from our recording session to our mix session quickly to the mastering, and from the mastering, it, it's up on iTunes as, as quick as they can process it and, and prepare it on the server, you know? Yeah, I mean, just, just a small footnote, they, still show, they should still pay us 
wheelbarrow loads full of money. Oh, yeah. We're not talking about that. Right. <laughs> right, Herb? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. yes. We need our rate, that's for sure. <laughs> do, um, do you ever get involved in the, the um, analog digital world argument or oh uh, yeah because you, it, you you have you have pretty unique needs i mean like especially when you were touring yeah. and recording records at, on yeah. tour you can't you can't do it with analog well my career is based around mobility i and that's one thing i really like about what i do um it would be great to to say i have a room and i mix every day and i don't have to go anywhere or do anything but i actually really like moving around with my clients i love I don't necessarily love the tour bus as much, but I like, you know, with the Usher Project, we moved around different studios. Mm -hmm. And our clients need those songs to come back everywhere we go the same exact way they heard them because they've listened to them 1,000 times between mm -hmm. that, you know, the New York and the LA flight. They've, they know what it sounds like. So I don't have time in my own methods to recall a board, to recall well, settings. The, the analog stuff's so old now, yeah. you can't find two 1176s that sound alike. No. So I, everything I do is in the box. Everything I do is on two faders. I don't, spl I don't even, you know, some people will put all the music out of one and two and the vocals three and four so they can turn it up with the headphones. I don't even do that. They get exactly what they're hearing in the box for me because it has to be the same every single time. That's why, so I, I'm digital. Like, I, I always make fun of my friend Ben Allen because he has these huge plate reverbs and I'll take pictures next to them with my eye lock. Like, <laughs> I, you know, that's nice, but I've got this. Did you watch the show with Simon Franklin? He said uh, when he did... Uh, the, the, the movie Titanic, he had literally two tons worth of gear. When he did Avatar, he had one, one computer. <laughs> you remember that, Herb? Yeah, that's, that's, that's still shocking to me. Well, I would like to be all on my laptop if possible. That's where it's going. Yeah. I mean, some of the most amazing productions I've heard are, are off of, you know, mm -hmm. Swedish House Mafia sitting in there. Headphones. Alex the Kid was yeah. on the show and yeah. all, all those all those hits. Yeah. Love the way you lie. He yeah. he was on a train out of London and did them on his laptop. Yeah. I'm I mean, eventually I would like to have the toys sitting around in a room just to have. Yeah, but we all do. We're the, engineers. The way it works is that doesn't that's not gonna help and it does not apply to my everyday. I've gotta be able to bring everything back the same exact way it was. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, all I, digital. I, I, my world now is um, is like that. I mean, it, it, too much analog, and I can't, I can't get, give the client what they want because right. they know we don't do recalls like like back in the day. What you know, back in the day, a recall was a six-hour process and mm -hmm. five grand. Now a recall is pretty quick, unless you use too yeah. much of the old stuff. Well, we were, I was just, your, your guy Dylan was just doing a mix for one of my clients, mm -hmm. and we had about, oh, he said so. well, yeah, we had about 15 revisions, and you know what, he turned those around 15 minutes at a time, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you went, and, and while working on eight other things, he, he, he told me, he's like, you don't want to see what I'm doing right now, you wouldn't believe it, and I, and I do believe it, but I know because mm -hmm. we can recall things immediately that you'll be able to deliver this for us. Dylan can multitask like nobody I've ever seen, he's and on no sleep. Yeah, he's a beast. The dude sleeps one day a month. <laughs> In the studio. When he was my assistant, I'm telling you, he, he, he never slept. Yeah. Uh, man, I had a good question I, I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. Um, where was it? I can't remember where it was. Um, when, when you first got into doing this, your passion for music was, was a driver. There's so many people out there that, that I, I talk to and they're like, man, I love music, I love music. There's a huge gap between loving music and trying to earn a living doing music. Yeah. What when that reality hit you? What did you think? <clears throat> well, I mean, you, you you were on a tour bus. You hadn't seen your home in a month. Probably hadn't showered in a month. You got no sleep. I mean, and you're sitting there. I love music. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's a different world. I, I, you know what it hits you is when somebody who doesn't do it looks at what you do and, and they say, "Oh my God." You know where I come from. What I do is pretty glamorous compared to the people I grew up with and, and what they're doing. And not, you know, I would like to be doing probably what they're doing because it's, it's a lot less hours. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I, it hits you when somebody else says, you do that for a living, or you know so-and-so, you know, and to us, that's, that's, that's no big deal to know anybody, because yeah. it's just, it's the industry working, yeah. but that's when it, it hits you. I mean, I, I go through my times like anybody else where I'm like, oh, you know, F this, I don't want to, I, I hate doing this, but at the end of the day, I get paid to make music, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's a great feeling. Oh, I remember what I want to talk to you about. Um, Herb, I, I'm guessing that, that in terms of playing an instrument in pop music, in the mm -hmm. pop world, hip-hop world, probably 90% of the, of the artists are, are self-taught, learned by ear, wouldn't you say? It's a pretty high percentage. Yeah. So a, a lot of times <clears throat> engineers that, that, that read music that are very accomplished musicians Sometimes they, uh, they, uh, they think that, well, I'm a pretty good musician, so I'm talking about myself. Sometimes they think that that, that gives them an advantage. And I think, I think if used properly, it can give you an advantage. But in the same way that a lot of great records are made by people that learn by ear, I think engineering can be learned by ear, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you kind of alluded to that in, 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 in one interview I saw. By the way, those interviews uh, on YouTube that you have, what's it called? Mix? Mix Majors. Mix Majors. Those yeah. are good. They're short. Yeah. They're to the point. Uh, look them up. Mix Majors. Uh, uh, you can just type that in yeah. YouTube and get to Yeah, yeah. There's like a channel, I believe, that's, mm -hmm. so it should come up pretty Yeah, quick. you and Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah say Sam. Hello to Sam. Yeah, we love Sam. Um, those, are, those are good. I, I can't remember if that's where you said it, but uh, uh, I really, I, I I think in a, in a perfect world, you want to learn everything there is to know about everything, not just music, but you should learn physics, chemistry, religion. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the time to learn all those, don't feel inferior because you can learn to engineer by ear, <laughs> if, if that is a phrase, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I think, it, I, again, this is, you know, Leslie Brathway has been a big mentor of mine. And what I would do with him is when he was mixing. He went to full sale, I believe. Yeah, he went to full sale. I would. I would watch, I would kind of pay attention on the board where, where about he was, but then I would listen to what he's doing and not watch how much the numbers he was turning up mm -hmm. or the frequencies. I would spend, I would listen to what he's doing, just pay attention to where, okay, this is what he's working on, and I would mm -hmm. listen. And I think that's how I kind of developed my ear for that. And also, when it comes to things like, you know, because I don't play an instrument, when it comes to things like pitch or instrumentation, being uh, coming up at DARP and then, then later moving on to working with great artists, they. They all know what they're talking about, so you have to learn very quickly. The lingo too. is, is yeah. the communication part. Yeah, important. You, you, you picked that up over time. Yeah, tis that time. Let's Mr. do it. Let's do it. Warm. You know what? I've got your actually. Back. I, okay. I warmed up before I came in because I knew yeah. that that exit was in the plug-in, so I knew uh, it might be a challenge for me today. Uh, Some of these analog wins, so I, can, I can knock them out. He has his bat. He's warmed up. Let's Good. fire it up. Okay, lead vocals. Lead vocals is going to be the waves of the esser. SSL channel strip, the G or the E, depending. Um, Dark Essence, crazy. R Vox, don't forget. And then, no, the R Vox is last. Okay. Yep. Um, background vocals. Same thing. Same thing? Yeah, keep it simple. Okay. Is there, oh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Acoustic guitar. Acoustic guitar. That's going to be a little different. That's going to probably start with an SSL channel just to figure it out, but I may use the Tube Tech plugin, the CL1B, the compressor plugin. Um, and I also may use the um, the API plugins, the Waves stuff. Okay, yeah, and yeah. the SSL is the Waves plugin. Yeah, too. yeah. Okay, um, do you make a distinction between like a, a singing lead and a rap lead, or is it the same cha chain for same a rap chain. thing? Okay, yeah. uh, piano, electric yeah. piano. Hmm, that's probably going to be the uh, the Waves, the Puig Child. And oh. then, uh, and then probably the, uh, the which, which pig, pig, the, oh the pig child yeah 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 exactly the, and um, um, fair child yeah and uh, and the SSL EQ again I'm so simple well, that's what we learned on you <laughs> yeah know? exactly I, I think that's why we use them so much it's yeah. a comfort factor when you see it yeah. uh, synth strings that's probably going to be that PSP vintage warmer again so I gotta look at that yeah it's it's cheap it's simple but it's do I awesome. have that Drew oh I got it cool yeah. uh, synth bass. Synth bass is going to be, boy, you know, I keep giving the same answers, but it exists. Um, the, tu the, the Tube Tech plug-in again, and then the Puig Tech, the, the PE1C, or the, yeah, what is it, the EQP1A, that's what I need to say. The yeah. Pool Tech? Yeah. Uh, electric guitar. Electric guitar, 
I'm the worst SSL channel. Yeah. No, in the Renaissance X, the um, it's like the oh, R box. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I start that with plug that, in. and then I throw the channel on after it. I forget about that plug in. I'm yeah. ask you, remind me to ask you about that. Yeah. Uh, kick, R box and uh, EQP one A. Uh, I gotta write that down. Yeah. I can, <laughs> I can, you do Please use think. vocal things on your drums. Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, snare. Um, that's going to be the SPL Transient Designer and the um, Abbey Road Brilliance Pack. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, golly, I, I can't ask. Well, I'll ask you anyway. Stereo bus. Yeah. Uh, th the only thing that's happening on my stereo bus is metering. I have, the, you know, the, the phase meters and analyzers just so I can kind of keep an eye on things. That's okay. it. Um, but what I do do is, is I, uh, I run my... I run the mix out of the AES and I come back in two ways and one way I go through an auxiliary that's compressing everything just so the client can have a loud version and then I print the, the dry version as well. How do you do Herb? Um, be, be, out of here. Be gentle. That's boring, right? No, 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 that, no. That, that bar went into like the second tier. I thought so too. Yeah, absolutely. I Chipper jones did. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You're Homer now. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I got a couple of quick follow-up questions. Sure. Um, what advantage do you get by having the same equipment on the on the leads and the backs? Like some some schools of thought say, the leads should be duller and should sit around this and do that. I never I never think that way. I just do my lead, then I do my backs and just make them sound good. But yeah. if you're using the same equipment on both, then you must be of the philosophy just whatever it takes to make them sound good. I don't try to get them out well, of the way or mm -hmm. dull them up. So what I'm using the, what I'm using doesn't matter. Would the effect, you know, it it could be the the Avid EQ7, which is a, you know, this is a good old EQ in its own right. What what I'm using doesn't matter. What I have to do with it is what matters. So for me, that that chain that I told you gives me the elements that I need. It gives me the DSing, which I'm always going to need. Mm -hmm. um, it gives me the compression that I like, and then it gives me the EQ I can add. You know, it's mm -hmm. I it's interchangeable. It used to be our compressor, and then the our, the Renaissance EQ. And when you're using the um, the Arvox on the kick drum, what is it that you're listening for to happen? Uh, it makes it more present. The Arvox is just a, it's a pretty amazing plugin. To me, I think it's the uh, I'll just say it. I think it's the better version of what people try to do with the L1 on things. Oh, okay. I think people use that L1 on all kinds of instruments and. It drives me crazy. There's an overtone distortion that the L1. It's a little yeah. older plug-in. It's still, it's still my island yeah. plug-in. If I could have right. one plug-in, I'd right. take the L1 or either that or the Renaissance. Yeah, effect. see, and I would throw it out of the pack. Like it, it drives me crazy. I think the Arvox, from what I do, it, it does that, but in the way I want to hear it, and mm -hmm. it kind of it takes things from here and moves them here. Which essentially, you're trying to, in a mix, you're trying to position things in yeah, a spatial, yeah. mm -hmm. perceived spatial space. Mm -hmm. So that's what our our box says to me because we know the vocal needs to be here, we know the kick needs to be here. So that's yeah, what I use the, 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 uh, once again, I'm referring the audience to Akon's "Beautiful," um, or if you want to go to "My Beautiful" by Christina, you can too. Um, that that mix does have layers to it. Yeah. And 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 even though you tracked it, I'm not giving you an insult, but. A lot of that wasn't given to you that way, those layers. I mean, you, right. you definitely... It's the MP3 multi-track, man. <laughs> it's all about that. <laughs> Drew, yes, sir. our corner office is busy and we got are. stuff for him. We are. Let's tee um, up a few. So here we go with our brother Drew Adams over there in the corner office. What the deal? Go, um, Drew. Go, Drew. <laughs> uh, you touched on it earlier a little bit uh, when you guys were talking about Akon. Um, but from Chris, Midnight Realm, you can get a little more uh, specific. For drums to give added, sometimes extra presence, would you consider using heavy distortion and perhaps even clipping? And if so, how would you control it so it doesn't get out of hand? And particularly the kick drum. I would, I would never do that. It's, it's just not in my school of thought. I'm, I, if they need to be driven, I'm, I may look for, I may just turn everything else down. That's really what it is. I don't. I don't try to color things up like that. I, w I would never add distortion or try to clip something. Mm -hmm. It's. It's not me. I think. I think the sounds are there. The producer picked them for a reason, so they've got to work. Let me find a way. But I, I don't drive things like in that regard ever. Let me, let me jump in on this. Yeah. Um, clipping is is 
more of an old school analog concept. In the digital world, you don't really get rewarded for clipping no. anything. You get yeah. creamed because your mix starts going. So, uh, uh, Chris, I, I don't know. I don't know where you're at in terms of your career, and I'm not making fun of you, but uh, you, you might have just chosen a, 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 the wrong word. But clipping is, is an analog technique that can work pretty well. In the digital world, you have to go to things like. Uh, uh, decapitator by mm -hmm. sound toys and you can you can experiment with those and then there's some saturation plugins like he uses that that don't necessarily give you the clipping but they give you the the the, 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 the effect of something that's being pushed to tape kind of hard mm -hmm. tee up another one drew cool cool um from tom tk kid um my former buddy I'm, I'm scared my to former know what assistant buddy <laughs> oh no he, he well he just wanted to know he said uh who was your most memorable session at darp in your early days at DARP. Yeah. Uh, why didn't he say uh, Silent Sound? Well, I, because he knows I came up there and he knows the debauchery that would happen at DARP. So yeah. I'd have to say George Clinton. I'm just amazing talent and just it's kind of like working on another planet when he's in the room. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen, but boy, just something very special about that. It's you can't put words in uh, on it. Sorry, TK, but yeah, he knows what I mean, though. I'm well, sure. give me a hint. What did, what, did, what, 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 what did Clinton do? Everything is wrong and everything is right. Put it that way. Every, everything you're, that is technically supposed to happen doesn't happen that way at all. It's all reversed. Um, but it's funky. You know what I mean? So you mean like he uses equipment the wrong way to get something? Yeah, everything is just way too loud, way too oh. distorted, way too, but way too awesome. You know, it's just. Mm. Yeah. All taste. Yeah, exactly. By the way, guys, uh, TK is a very, very close friend of both of ours and someone that was very important in my uh, development and learning. And he, he has a great studio in Atlanta, arguably one of the best, if not the best, silent sound. Mm -hmm. nice. For sure. Uh, cool. I've got a, a two part question here from, Sh I'm going to mess this last name up, so forgive me. Shalem Bansivenga. Uh, how do you, <laughs> you messed it up. <laughs> yeah. How do you convince an artist who has demoitis that your that your new mix oh, is better wow. than the rough? Awesome do you prefer question. Do you prefer to have the artist in the studio with you while you mix, or to present them with the song after you reach a place where it's? Presentable? I keep Drew heavily armed with major, major firepower. That's right. how I do it. <laughs> you know, it works. You can't convince them in words. If you, nor should you try, should you? No, no. If I don't mix without a rough mix, which I, I assume you don't either. Nobody, no, you should no. you should never do that. No. Um, so you should know you should already know what zone they're in, and you should know where. It, I guess with the, with enough experience, you should know where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, say that again, because that's important. Well, with the right amount of experience of of, of assisting for a long time and mm -hmm. even tracking, understanding what a client is thinking by the time they get to a mix. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we do that game a lot where our mixes sometimes are more of mind games. Where it's not so much the, the technical part of, oh, I have to make sure this is up or down. Mm -hmm. It's more so, what do they really want? What do they really want? Yeah. What do they really want? KD, I don't know if you saw the show last week with KD, but he, he, um, he, he kind of opened my eyes up to the importance of referencing the the rough mix even a lot more than I do because I reference it a lot mm -hmm. but he, he, he definitely understands that nowadays people spend weeks on those rough mixes yeah. I um real Months quickly on those rough mixes. real quickly um, on the current usher project um, when I looked at his um, his iPod that had the rough mixes of what we've been doing um, when I plugged it in and I could see an iTunes it showed me his playlist um, I mean the amount of plays he had listened to one of, uh, before the climax had come out, when we were still in the rough mix stage, before Manny ever got the final mix, mm. he listened to my rough 1,200 times. Oh my God. So That's incredible. So you have to pay attention you have to, to pay that. Attention. You know what I mean? Akon would listen to our rough mixes hundreds of times before yeah. I even had a chance to go in. Yeah. And at that point, you're really, you're really just inflating what you have. You know what I mean? So. Have you yeah. ever had a, because you, you're, you have the luxury sometimes of creating the rough mix, yeah. which uh, let's call it a reference mix in your case. Right. Have, have, have you ever had trouble beating it? Oh, yeah. You know what? And it's funny because a lot of times I won't even want to mix stuff like, like on this Usher project. I'm very happy to hand that stuff off because I've spent so much time on, on my own stage. There's no way for me to rewire my brain to, make, to take that to a new place. You know what I mean? I'd be shooting myself in the foot, mm -hmm. actually. It mm -hmm. only helped me to give it to somebody else and say, take what I did and make it better. Wow. Yeah. Drew, last one. 
Cool, cool. From uh, Peter Carter. I know you said you don't compress that much, but I'm just curious. When would you parallel compress live drums, if not all the time? Parallel compress. Don't do that either. I, I, I'm boring in that regard. It's got to balance right. It all starts there. If the balance is right and the music all wraps around a certain way, you don't need to do that. You know, and sometimes I do. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I need it, to. Yeah, but sometimes the production does need help, and that's when instead of compressing things, I'll look to add things. Since he doesn't do it, can I answer that, Drew? Absolutely. Yeah, please. What Exit is saying is 100% the perfect example of how there's more than one way to get to the same spot. There's there's a thousand different ways to get from here to Pacoima and there's a thousand different ways to get the kick drum or the, the drums to sound the way you want them. He does it one way, I, I do it another way. I, I, I tend to, um, we tend to get to the same place, I'm not trying to give myself a compliment, but um, the reason I compress is I like the dynamics of a drum a certain way, the, the liveness of the drums, I like the dynamics. But if I want certain things like a little more attack uh, to bring it a little to the front of the mix a little bit, but I don't want to destroy the, 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 the dynamics, I'll compress a copy of it and get that and add it back in so I preserve the original but still accomplish what, what you accomplish right. with, with half the effort. Right. I, I, that's the skill I don't have, so I, I, I cheat and do it that way. That's when, that's when I would do it. So here's the last question. Mm -hmm. When you're a guest on the show, you're automatically submitted into the comeback list. So whether you had a good time or not, <laughs> we're bringing you back. But Wonderful. hopefully you had a good time. Yeah, I did. Thank did you? you so much. Yeah. Will you come back? Great. Oh, of course I will. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, cool. Thanks, yeah. cool. Cool. Thanks, cool. Just a quick reminder, um, keep, keep an eye on his website, uh, exit 1200.com. And um, Check out the uh, the mentoring program of, of that the Big Brothers are doing, and seeing if that's something you might want to contribute to. Mm -hmm. that, those are two important things to kind of keep in mind from all of this. And, and I think you just have to also keep in mind soulful Saturdays and Sinatra Sundays. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's good. I <laughs> yeah, like that. Cool. So un unfortunately, we have to exit. So Dave, wrap it up and let's go. Uh, man, I, I just want to say thank you again for for being with us. I say this every week, and every week Drew can testify. I go straight home and apply what uh, I just learned today, and today is no exception. I've, I've learned a lot from you. And you guys, um, I, I, I really mean this. Go to the web, look up Exit. I think, I think you guys that are just coming along can learn a lot from his story, a lot from his career path. He's, he's a, a great example of a cat that did it right. He didn't try to do it quickly. He didn't try to do it to make money. He did it just because he loves this crap that we do, like we all do. And, and he, he, he was successful because he had no choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so study that, because I think, I think one of the reasons I was so excited to have him on the show is I, I felt like he could really teach you guys that, that are interested in this as a career the right way to do it, from his attitude to, to just packing up one day and leaving his, the comfort of his home with 30,000 people. So uh, we got a lot in store for you. Uh, I, 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 I'm working on, on, a, on a, an ITL for next week that I think you're going to like. Uh, we haven't done one in a, in a day or two, so um, this one's going to be special. And thanks for all the support, and we will see you next week. <laughs>